Okay, guys, all we have is one last section of chapter eight to talk about. And I'd like to just begin with a brief review of what we've been talking about, uh, at least in the, in the previous lecture. And that was the fact that when we look at catabolism in cells, we're describing three basic mechanisms or processes, overall processes, aerobic, anaerobic, and finally fermentation. We're gonna talk about fermentation in a few minutes, but I wanna just take a second and go back and just briefly review the difference between aerobic and anaerobic so that you have some sense of what those three um, pathways are and why they differ from one another. And what you'll notice when, again, you look at the first two, um, that for the most part, they're very much similar, almost identical with respect to glycolysis, followed by, again, the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and then finally, electron transport. The major difference obviously lies in what the final electron acceptor is. And as we've said, in the case of aerobic respiration, it is molecular oxygen that ultimately combines with those electrons in electron transport. And the combination of those electrons and the molecular oxygen and some hydrogen ions to produce H2O or water. In the case of anaerobic respiration, the final electron acceptor is not oxygen. That's why we use the term anaerobic without oxygen. And in that case, as you see at the bottom of that second column, there are other compounds that ultimately accept those electrons to form a number of byproducts, as we talked about at the very end of the preceding lecture. Nitrogen sulfide, for example, the rotten egg odor is a gas produced by certain methanogens. Um, nitrate and nitrites are produced by different bacteria in anaerobic respiration. We'll be talking more about those sorts of bacteria coming up very soon in lab when we start working on our unknowns. Uh, the other uh, notable difference lies in the energy output per original glucose. And as you see at the bottom of each of the columns, in the case of aerobic respiration, we said that for each glucose that enters glycolysis and goes through the Krebs cycle and eventually goes, the electrons go into the electron transport system, you would produce, the cell would produce theoretically as many as 38 ATPs. We also talked in the previous lecture that that number is pretty much inflated for a number of different reasons. You can go back and you know watch my explanation of that, or you can check it out in the book, but we're, we're down to 30 to 32, more a realistic number of ATPs per glucose. And we said, uh, with respect to anaerobic, that that number can vary appreciably depending upon what kind of microbe it is we're talking about. So we won't get into any more than, than simply saying that. Um, and so what we wanna do for the duration of the rest of chapter eight today is to talk about fermentation. And what you'll note again in that far right-hand column that we're gonna be talking more about in just a moment is the fact that we do not have what two processes or mechanisms that the other two have. And the answer is there's no Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle, and there's no electron transport in fermentation. So it's a much more, uh, I'll, I'll just say simplistic, process, uh, not to say that it's not complicated, you know, in terms of its biochemistry, because there is a lot of chemistry going on here, but it's not as involved, let's put it that way, as these other two mechanisms are. And the other takeaway message is that the final electron acceptor in the case of fermentation is typically some sort of organic compound. And I'll give you specific examples of that in just a second. Finally note that the maximum ATP 
per original glucose is two. And, and we can stick pretty firmly to that number, okay? Two ATP per glucose in fermentation pathways. Okay, so let's talk about fermentation. Um, I think the bullets there on the left-hand side of the slide pretty much review a large part of what I just me mentioned a few moments ago. Um, I want you also to notice that the end product of fermentation can vary depending upon the cell type. Um, this can occur in both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. Um, and I think I'm just going to go to the next slide because it's going to do a better job kind of describing those end products. And we're going to talk about two different types of fermentation. There are other kinds, but we're going to hit the two major types today. And of course, you see those as alcoholic and acidic fermentation. If you think back to ANP1, if you had me, we did talk briefly about fermentation. Um, in, I think it was chapter three of the book. We also specifically discussed lactic acid fermentation um, in, this, in the muscle chapter, specifically skeletal muscle can undergo this. So again, the process in eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells can be alcoholic and acidic. This is not strictly just eukaryotic cells, not strictly prokaryotic cells. Both basic types of cells can undergo these two mechanisms, certain types of cells. So let's talk about alcoholic fermentation. We've all enjoyed the benefits of this, um, whether it's an alcoholic beverage, like you see on the left-hand side there, a beer, wine, um, al uh, champagne. Um, there are just a whole host of different compounds produced as a result of fermentation, right? Uh, I remember my dad used to make um, wine at home, just a small, he had a small oak barrel and he got grapes in the fall of the year and we crushed them up and he put them inside the, um, oh, he first mixed it with sugar and had some yeast and then put this sort of slurry in the, um, I probably filtered it now that I think back um, to when he did that, uh, filter off the the um, the skin of the grapes and, and the seeds and so forth. And then the liquid, the grape juice, the sugar, the yeast got put into this oak, small oak barrel. And then he had a cork uh, in the barrel and, and a, basically a, a plastic tube flexible tube that he put down into the um, barrel. And then he had the other end of the tube going into a, a quart jar of water. So the end of the tube was underwater. And uh, as the fermentation process occurred, and I think he had it in there, well, he should have had it in there for a year. I think it got pulled out after probably about six months, um, but it took, it took a number of months. And as time went on, you could see the some bubbles coming out the end of the uh, the tube. And so what what he was seeing, what we were seeing there was the carbon dioxide being given off in that process of alcohol fermentation. So let's take a look at the left hand side of this slide and see what was going on uh, in that oak barrel. So we have, of course, at the top, uh, this fuel molecule, if you will, that the yeast is going to utilize, good old glucose. Now, dad used sugar, sucrose, that he bought at the store. But what ends up happening is that sucrose, which is a disaccharide made up of glucose and fructose, those two monosaccharides, those had to be broken apart or cleaved. The glycosidic link between those monosaccharides was broken and then the individual monosaccharides were liberated. And, and so here we have one of those end products, glucose coming into the fermentation process here. So you remember 
uh, glycolysis, go back into last uh, segment's lecture where we talk about the, uh, I think, eight different reactions, right, of glycolysis. And I'm not going to review all those, but you do remember, I hope, that uh, initially early on in that process, there were a couple ATPs degraded, right? Those phosphate groups got slapped onto the glucose to make a variety of intermediary chemicals. Um, eventually that six carbon glucose was split in half to form two three carbon compounds. And then in the number of additional reactions, about four more reactions, eventually um, four ADPs were phosphorylated to make four ATPs. We also said that because two were broken down initially and then four were made at the end, the end uh, product is the formation of two ATPs, a net gain of two ATPs per glucose. The other thing that we talked about was also the formation of two electron carrier molecules. And of course, I'm talking about these two guys here, NADH. So there are actually two NAD pluses that acquire electrons from these intermediate byproducts of the glucose breakdown. It actually occurs in, in uh, enzyme uh, reaction six there in figure 8.17 of your book. Um, and so when NAD plus gains electrons like it's doing here, that's what kind of a reaction, do you remember? You have two choices, an oxidation or a reduction. You have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. What do you think? When NAD plus gains electrons and becomes NADH, that is a reduction reaction, a reduction reaction. So here's reduction taking place early on in the process. Um, and ordinarily, if we were talking about aerobic respiration or anaerobic respiration, where would those NADHs end up going? Do you remember? Well, if you said the electron transport system, you are right. But in fermentation, we don't have that. Okay, so we'll talk about what happens to the electrons that NADHs, those two NADHs are holding in just a moment. But here is pruvic acid. And you remember that there are two of those produced per glucose. So they really should have, should have two of them, but we have to just remember that there are two made. Okay, remember those um, um, that, that oak barrel and the bubbles coming out that we were talking about a few moments ago, and I said that was carbon dioxide. So here is the CO2 that gets produced when there's a bond broken here within the pruvic acid. And when you take a three carbon pyruvic acid and you pull a CO2 off of it, you make a two carbon compound. And there it is, it's called a aldehyde. okay? So pyruvic acid is degraded in alcoholic fermentation into acetaldehyde. And one carbon dioxide is manufactured as a byproduct. Okay, these NADHs that we were talking about that were made in glycolysis, these electrons that, that are being carried, just as quickly as NADH is made, NADH is oxidized. It loses its electrons, and those electrons and some hydrogens go on to, gets added, added on to the acetaldehyde, or acetaldehyde, I should say, and we make ethyl alcohol, or ethanol for short. So there's the alcohol that's produced at the end. It's a two carbon compound. And this is what goes into the, the distillation process to make the beer um, or the champagne or the brandy or the whiskey or whatever the alcoholic beverage is. Now the carbon dioxide that is also produced in the uh, manufacture of alcoholic beverages, for example. In the olden days, it used to just be uh, you know, released into the air. Like, like my dad uh, 
and the bubbles that went into the, the cord jar, those bubbles just came out, popped, and went out into the room. Well, in today's world, uh, this CO2 is worth some money. It can be used. Um, and so many of the larger you know, corporations that, that do this for, you know, on a commercial basis, they'll, they'll gather this CO2 somehow, save it, and, um, and either, either use it in some other way or sell it. Um, I believe that's pretty much the case today. Okay. Now, if you're making bread or cinnamon rolls, who cannot resist a good cinnamon roll, this same process takes place. And it's the CO2 that's produced here that helps the, the dough rise for your loaf of bread or your cinnamon roll. Okay, it's actually used in the process of making the bread or, or whatever baked good it is you're making. Now there's also ethyl alcohol produced in this process. And so you might say, well, why doesn't my cinnamon roll taste like beer or uh, my bread taste like wine or taste alcoholic? Well, the, the reason that, you, that these, these baked goods don't taste like alcohol is because when they're baked, the alcohol is basically evaporated off in the baking process. Okay, so that's alcoholic fermentation, widely used to make a number of commercially important products in our world today. Bacteria undergo this process as well sometimes. If there's no oxygen, because you don't see any oxygen here either, but I want you to be careful you know, this is anaerobic in the sense that there's no oxygen, but there's also anaerobic respiration. So don't, don't get them mixed up. The other type of, of fermentation, of course, you see here is acidic fermentation. And so that kind of talks about this right-hand half of the diagram. And we're gonna focus our attention to what occurs in our skeletal muscle and in certain bacteria called homolactic bacteria that undergo this type of uh, acidic fermentation. This, the process begins with glucose, ends with two pyruvic acid being made. We also make two ATPs, come out ahead two, net gain of two, right? We also make a couple NADHs. So again, it's the same basic process as occurs in alcoholic fermentation. But what happens to the pyruvic acid now is gonna be different than what happened earlier in ethyl alcohol fermentation. Here we made a two carbon ethyl alcohol, we spun off a CO2. In, in acidic fermentation, this three carbon pyruvic acid maintains its three carbon skeleton, if you will, but the hydrogens and the electrons that are gonna now be pulled off of the NADH as it becomes oxidized, is going to go into kind of revamping, if you will, some of the bonds in the pruvic acid such that lactic acid is made, okay? Now, the NAD pluses that are gonna be produced in either process here can then be reused, can go back up and gather more electrons as more glucose is broken down. So again, this series of dotted pink lines should make sense to you. The NAD+, plus, the empty school bus that we, we talked about that analogy in the previous lecture, is, is also then going back to pick up more passengers in the form of electrons as more glucose is converted into pyruvic acid. Okay, so back to lactic acid for just a moment. This can build up in cells. Let's talk about our cells, uh, because again, it's something we can all appreciate because I think we've all, suffered from muscle cramps. When you run a race, for example, or, or you exert yourself uh, you know, um, physically to the point of exhaustion, right? You hit that, that, that brick wall, if you will, and you just kind of crash. Sometimes that can happen if you overdo it. Um, and that lactic acid can build up inside skeletal muscle and result in muscle cramps. Um, you can also build up what's referred to as an oxygen debt that must be repaid um, as the liver, as your liver converts that lactic acid back into glucose. I'm not gonna get into that. That's A and P 
but uh, we did talk about that process uh, in ANP1. So lactic acid is sometimes used um, and produced by, by bacteria. Um, and that's, again, um, dependent upon the type of prokaryotes we're talking about. But the same process occurs in your cells if they go anaerobic, if you, if you uh, utilize all of the oxygen that the lungs are, are, are bringing in, um, and the red blood cells are transporting to your muscles, if you exceed the uh, capacity of the respiratory and circulatory systems, cardiovascular systems, to keep up with the needs of the muscle, then your muscle goes anaerobic and it, and it goes to the cystic fermentation process. So you're only producing two ATP per glucose as opposed to 30 or so aerobically. You can see, so it's, it's 1 15th, 1 16th as efficient. And so you, you can't really finish the race if you go up acidic fermentation, you just can't supply enough ATP to the muscles for them to contract. You hit the brick wall. Okay, so this particular slide just talks about the diverse pathways that pyruvate or pyruvic acid, same thing, um, can take depending upon what the cell type is that we're describing. Now, earlier we talked about the conversion of pyruvic acid into ethanol in terms of alcohol fermentation. And, and this was the yeast that my dad added to the uh, grape juice, right? And the sugar, and he made wine from that. Or Coors makes beer from that, or whatever the case may be. But these other um, green terms, of course, which you see of, are in uh, uh, italics, refer to what? Capital first letter tells me that all of these are genus terms. Okay, don't forget, underline or italicize. Capital letter, first letter tells me genus. So in the case of these various diverse species of bacteria, we can have that pyruvate undergo a, a number of different kinds of fermentations, different kinds of fermentation, resulting in the formation of different kinds of acids. So lactic acid is just one kind of acid produced by fermentation. Notice some of these other ones, butyric acid, propionic acid, acetic acid, that's actually vinegar, um, formic acid. Um, so different kinds of bacteria, different genera of bacteria, utilize this pyruvate and can create a diverse array of different kinds of acids. And we use that knowledge to help us determine what our unknown might be. If, if butyric acid is made via fermentation, it's likely we're dealing with clostridium. If propionic acid is made, it's likely it's propionibacterium and so on and so forth. So different metabolic tests can be used and you are going to use different kinds of acidic tests to see if you can help uh, un understand what the idea of your unknown might be. So more on that coming up in just a couple uh, weeks in labs. Okay, so here we've got a table that um, again, takes a look at the three uh, metabolic strategies that heterotrophic microbes utilize as they assimilate glucose. So this is very similar to the first table that I, uh, or figure that I showed uh, at the beginning of this lecture. Um, very, very similar. Um, so here we're looking at, again at what pathways are involved, what the final electron acceptors are, what sort of products are made, and also some um, um, descriptive terms that we could use to describe the types of, of prokaryotes that can undergo these various processes. So it would be worth taking some time and just kind of looking at this table in conjunction with the previous figure where we're comparing all three uh, you know, at one time.
Okay, so we have been talking for the most part um, about ways in which cells take glucose and break it down. Okay, we, we defined that at the very first lecture as a catabolic mechanism. Remember catabolism, the breakdown of bigger, more organic, uh, bigger, more complex organic compounds into smaller, simpler ones. Anabolism is the opposite. It's the, take, it's the taking of the smaller, simpler molecules and combining them to make bigger, more complex ones. We're going to kind of try to see how the two processes can fit together here, because cells don't just break, you know, glucose down or food down. They also have to build bigger, more complex organic molecules from some of those intermediary pro uh, molecules formed. So this ability to um, kind of understand as a cell, to understand when you need to break things down and when you need to build things up is um, getting at the heart of what a cell tries to do in terms of maximizing its efficiency. Now, again, I'm not saying a cell thinks about this. Obviously that can't happen. But through evolutionary processes, in order to maintain homeostasis at the cellular level, okay, I gotta think about this a little bit, because we've often talked about homeostasis as it relates to you and I, but we can apply that, that concept even down to the cellular level. So a cell needs to be able to maintain a stable internal state. If it needs to make energy, it's gotta break food down, right? Glucose down. If it needs to make more cell wall or cell membrane as it divides, it's gotta undergo anabolism. And through really the activation and deactivation of genes, a cell can do that. And therefore it can maximize its efficiency. So this ability of a cell to undergo catabolism as well as anabolism at certain particular important times gets to the idea that cells um, can integrate these two pathways to improve its efficiency. And this is referred to as an amphibolic technique or pathway or an amphibolic um, property, I guess. So amphibolism is the term that's just defined in your book. And it's, it basically says, quote, the property of a system to integrate catabolic and anabolic pathways to improve cell efficiency is amphibolism. So let me show you what that kind of means. So here we're looking at the major organic molecules. So we've got nucleic acids, you know, those are DNA, RNA, here's proteins, here's carbohydrates. We give the example of starch and cellulose, but there are many other kinds of carbohydrates. And then here's lipids. So these are the four main classes of organic molecules. We've talked about this back in a and one. This should be old news. These are important for a cell in the case of a nucleic acids to make chromosomes, in the case of a cell that needs to make more membrane or make more enzymes for reactions to occur more efficiently, more quickly, you need proteins to, to make those, you need amino acids to make proteins, which in turn become enzymes, some of them. Um, the, the formation of cell wall, peptidoglycan, right? The, the glycan portion of that is sugar. And you need carbohydrate to do that. An important constituent of cell membranes are phospholipids, right? So cells need these organic molecules for amphibolic pathways, mechanisms, to make important cell parts. Those four organic molecules all are made up of building blocks. Again, this is all review. Nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids and so on and so forth. You see those listed there. When we go up, we're talking amphibolism, the build, uh, the uh, anabolism, excuse me. We're talking about the buildup, the, man, the manufacture of bigger, more complex organic molecules. 
If we're going down, we're talking catabolism. So let's describe how there are times, as we've just discussed, where catabolic pathways are needed for a cell, let's say, to make energy. And we spent the last hour plus, more than that even, talking about the role of glucose in glycolysis, citric acid cycle, electron transport, right? Talked about that a lot. What this gets at is the idea that glucose is not the sole fuel molecule that cells break down catabolically. And, and I made a comment to this effect earlier in the second or the first lecture, I forget of this chapter. I said that while we will talk about glucose being the primary fuel molecule, cells can also utilize other organic compounds. Here's an example. There are times when a cell may take amino acids and deaminate those amino acids. You can read about what that basically means, but it's a very simple process. Just check out figure 8.26C, deamination. You're basically taking the amine group and you're pulling it off of the amino acid. And when you do that, when you deaminate amino acids, you're breaking them down. And I want you to note here in this oval area, these red arrows, some of these deamination products can go into the formation of peruvic acid, which can in turn feed into cit citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, right, and electron transport. Other deaminated amino acids can produce products that go into the formation of some of those in intermediary compounds in the citric acid cycle. Remember those uh, eight reactions? Well, some of those intermediate molecules can be made from these, de these deaminated products. So the point I'm trying to simply have you think about, and we could also even go over here and talk about fatty acids, which are the building blocks of lipids, through a process called beta oxidation, the breakdown of fatty acids, that can fit into or lead to the production of acetyl coenzyme A, which remember is produced as a result of that, that uh, the linking reaction between peruvic acid and Krebs cycle. So the red arrows are indicating catabolic mechanisms. And again, it's not just glucose, even though we focused on this arrow and what happens afterwards. The reality is, Cells can break down amino acids, cells can break down fatty acids, and those byproducts can fit into a number of different locations within the general large schematic of cellular respiration. In terms of its amph amphibolic capabilities, note here that we can also undergo anabolism. Remember, that's the buildup of bigger, more complex molecules from smaller, simpler ones. So here we're talking about peruvic acid, if we follow this arrow, or one of those nine intermediate molecules produced during glycolysis feeding back into the production of amino acids. Okay. So through the amination reaction, it's called, we can take peruvic acid and we can add a, an amine group to that, sort of the opposite of deamination. And that uh, pervic acid can be formed into um, an amino acid like alanine. Again, check out figure 8.26a, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Pervic acid is there. You add an amine group, and you make alanine and water. Alanine is one of the 20 amino acids. And that in turn can be used to help produce proteins that the cell needs. It's also indicating that some amino acids can be converted into different kinds of nucleotides, which we know help in the construction of RNA and DNA. So this gets to be a rather complex um, interwoven uh, 
process, isn't it, when you think about it? And it's good to get an appreciation of what can occur in a cell. And again, a lot of this applies to eukaryotic cells as well. It's not just bacteria and prokaryotes. Okay, um, so that's going to end chapter eight. Uh, as I said uh, in the previous lecture, we are not going to cover section 8.6 on photosynthesis. So you can simply omit um, those last uh, five or six pages. <clears throat>